Nicole, whenever you're ready. Great, great. Thank you so much, Lorena. And welcome, everyone, to the second installment of the Inquiry and Insight Speaker Series. My name is Nicole Dumas, class of 1990 and on staff with the BLSA, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Today's deep dive, pun intended, will proceed as such. I'll cover a few housekeeping items. We'll hear from our featured speaker, Dr. Philip Landrigan. We'll then proceed into a Q&A session, and I'll come back with some closing remarks. So for logistics, um, please know that today's session is being recorded. You'll also want to note that everyone in the audience is muted and your webcams are off. Dr. Landrigan will take questions after the presentation as well. Most, if not all of us, are familiar with Zoom, else you would not be here online right now. But um, I'd just like to re-familiarize you with a few of the features that are on your screen. If you hover your mouse or tap the bottom of your screen or tablet, you'll see the chat feature, which is disabled for this session. You'll also see the raise hand feature, and I'll give instruction on when to use that if we need to clarify a question during the question and answer session. Speaking of Q&A, you'll also see that button. If you have a question for Dr. Landrigan, or if you'd like to address any issues with the host, please click on that button and look for the type your question section uh, at the bottom of the pop-up box. We'll get to as many questions as we can during the Q&A session. And lastly, you'll probably notice that there are some captions floating at the bottom of your screen. Those have been automatically turned on. If you'd like to turn them off, please click on the closed caption live transcription button and click on hide subtitle. You can always turn that feature back on by clicking live transcript and then clicking show subtitle. So now to set the table for today's presentation, you may know that January 1st began the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And that runs through from 2021 through 2030. This was proclaimed by the United Nations in an effort to support efforts to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health. With Earth Day approaching on April 22nd and the strong cohort of student and faculty environmentalists at Boston Latin School, um, this topic is rather fitting. We know that to save the environment, we must first save the oceans and we'll learn more about that from Dr. Landrigan in a few short moments here. But first, I'd like to introduce Peter Kelly, president of the Boston Latin School Association who will offer a warm introduction of Dr. Landrigan. Peter, the screen is yours. Thanks so much, Nicole, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you're joining us from for this second installment of our new Insights and in Inquiry series. We have alumni and family members of Boston Latin School from across the world joining us today. So thanks so much for being with us. After kicking off our series so successfully with uh, the remarkable Richard Clark, class of 1968, about a month ago, I'm delighted to welcome another of our truly most distinguished alumni to share insights with us today. Uh, Dr. Philip Landrigan, class of 1959, is the 2014 Boston Latin School Distinguished Graduate. He's a renowned pediatrician and epidemiologist. His impact on global public health ranks him among the giants in his field, particularly in regard to how public health policy has improved the well being of children the world over. His early work identified the deleterious effects of lead, even at very low levels, leading to federal policy changes to eliminate the substance from gasoline and paint. In the 1990s, a fundamental revamping of federal pesticide policy resulted from his work through the National Academy of Sciences, identifying children's particular susceptibility to the toxicity of a broad range of substances. An alumnus of Boston College, Harvard Medical School, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Dr. Landrigan returned to his alma mater several years ago to lead BC's Global Public Health Program. In 2015, he began work as co-chair of the Lancet's Commission on Pollution and Health. The commission's work uh, has concluded that global pollution contributes to 9 million excess deaths annually and poses an existential threat to planetary health. The learnings Dr. Landigan will share with us today on ocean pollution and public health represent a continuation of this work. Before he begins, I'd just like to say uh, to Dr. Landigan how personally grateful I am uh, for all he does for Boston Latin School. This is just, his, his time today is just one example um, of the many gifts he provides to the school. He's been a true friend uh, and hails from a true Latin School family. I know at least two of his brothers, uh, Latin School alumni themselves, are joining us on this call. And no doubt their father, a longtime revered English teacher at alma mater, looks down on his boys with great pride. 
So please join me in welcoming Dr. Philip Landrigan. Thank, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Nicole. It's it's great to be here. Great to be back at Latin School, even if I'm about four miles to the west of you. Close enough. Um, so today I want to talk about the oceans, but I'm not an oceanographer. I'm a pediatrician, and so I'm not going to talk about the oceans per se. Although I'll certainly get into the oceans, but I'm going to focus mm -hmm. on the impact that the oceans have on human health. And to do this, I'm going to share my screen and proceed with a slideshow. Uh, always takes a minute, sorry. Okay, we should be good now. Can somebody give me a thumbs up that you can see my slides? You are good to go. Thank you. Sorry, even though I live on Zoom these days, it always seems to take a minute to make that transition. Yeah, so this is the title of the talk. I thought I'd, I thought I'd go big. Ocean pollution, human health, and the future of humanity. And you'll see the two logos at the bottom, Boston College, where I have been now happily returned since 2018, and the Scientific Center of Monaco, who supported a good part of this work and with whom I continue to uh, collaborate. So let's start by, before I get into the slides, let, let's talk about some of the good things that the oceans provide to humankind. We'll get to the threats in a minute, but the good things. Uh, first of all, oceans cover 70%, 72% to be exact, of the world's surface. The great science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke once said that it's not sensible to call this planet Earth. We ought to call it ocean. When you look at the when you look at the planet from space, the oceans are the dominant feature. The oceans hold 90% of the world's water. 90, sorry, 97% of the world's water. They support some of the planet's most diverse and ancient ecosystems that have survived the great glaciers and the various extinct extinctions that have hit terrestrial life over, over the millennia. Also, much more relevant to the present situation, there are a couple of factoids that you ought to know. The first is that the oceans are a very important source of the oxygen we breathe. A very substantial fraction of the oxygen that you inhale with each breath is oxygen that was generated by microscopic organisms, cyanobacteria in the oceans. These are photosynthetic organisms that break down carbon dioxide and produce oxygen and release that oxygen to the atmosphere. The oceans are also very important in stabilizing the global climate. The oceans absorb something like 90% of the excess heat that human activity releases into the climate system. And the oceans absorb um, about one third of the, the carbon dioxide, the CO2, which is emitted into the atmosphere. They, in other words, the oceans act as a buffer for the Earth's climate. That, that comes at some cost because when the, when the oceans absorb all that carbon dioxide, they become more acidic the pH drops referred to as ocean acidification. And ocean acidification has some negative follow on effects. Uh, it can dissolve the shells of oysters and mussels. So if you like going down to the Cape in the summer and eating oysters, you better get your lifetime supply on board fairly quickly before they dissolve. And more seriously, although not obviously visible, ocean acidification dissolves the Micro, the calcium containing microscopic organisms that are at the very base of the marine food chain. And the consequences of that could be dire because of the microscopic organisms that support all the largest species of life in the sea are knocked off. Um, uh, a mass extinction could be the consequence. So those are, the, those are the good things that the oceans do for us. Oxygen, climate stability. They also provide food for more than 3 billion people. And of course, they're a source of joy and peace and tranquility for all of us who love the oceans. 
but the oceans are under threat. And the main source of the threat is human activity, uh, which has dumped pollutants into the ocean. It's caused sea surface temperatures to rise. Uh, see, uh, rising global temperatures are causing increasingly violent storms. Think Hurricane Sandy, uh, Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Irma. Uh, another consequence of the dumping of pollution into the ocean and, and the simultaneous warming of sea surface temperature is the proliferation of algal blooms, red tides, green tides, brown tides, and the migration of harmful bacteria into previously pristine water. I've already mentioned acidification. The oceans are losing oxygen. Fish stocks are going down worldwide in many places the extent that the livelihood of whole communities is threatened and people have had to move, migrate. Uh, dredging is tearing up the seabed along with mechanized trawling and oil exploration, and then pollution, which is the topic of the day. So let's let's talk about pollution. Um, by the way, I thought that, let me take a minute to, have, to tell you what this picture is. I graduated from Latin school in 59, went to BC, went to Harvard Medical School, and then in 67, 68, I went to Cleveland, Ohio to do my internship. This picture was taken in 1968, while, not by me, but it was taken in the same year that I was in Cleveland. This is a picture of the air in Cleveland, Ohio in 1968. We had a long interior corridor in my hospital, quarter mile long. On some days, you couldn't see down the length of that hallway, the air pollution was so intense. And I, I go into this digression to make the point that we've come a long, long way in this country in controlling several forms of pollution, air pollution, water pollution, pollution by toxic waste. And um, that's hold that thought because I'm gonna come back to it towards the end here, the point that pollution is something that can be controlled by organized political activity and leadership. So what is pollution? So pollution is waste material, unwanted material, economists would call it externalized material that's released into the environment by human activity. Human activity is key. So we're not talking about volcanic emissions, for example. Um, and typically pollution is harmful. It harms either human health or ecosystems or both. And some of the details here come from that report that Peter mentioned in the introduction, the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health. Lancet um, is the world's largest medical journal published out of London and they supported that work that we published a couple of years ago that was the lead into the ocean work we're doing now. So here were some of the key findings from that Lancet pollution report. Pollution kills about 9 million people per year. That's three times more than AIDS, tuberculosis and mal malaria together. And we believe, as Peter said in his introduction, that pollution along with climate change, along with some of the other uh, uh, major threats of human origin that afflict the earth today poses an existential threat to the sustainability of human societies. Doesn't throw, it doesn't pose a threat to the planet. The planet's gonna go on for bazillions of years more. And it probably doesn't even pose a threat to all of humanity. I'm sure that some humans will survive climate change, pollution, and all the other things we're doing to the planet. But what could happen is that modern societies in all their sophistication could collapse and that humans are reduced once more to the status of being hunter-gatherers moving across an empty landscape looking for the next meal with no time to write books, watch TV, get on the internet, explore space, do medicine. That's, that's, the, that's the worst case scenario and it's what we want to try to prevent. So we published our report on human health and ocean pollution in a journal called the Annals of Global Health in December, 2020. Uh, that DOI number up there is a, is a number that you can use to retrieve the full report by way of the internet. It's open access, it's fully available. And this was the bottom line conclusion of the report that ocean pollution is widespread, it's worsening and it's very complex and it poses a clear and present danger not only to the health of the oceans but also to human health and to human well-being 
So what are the components of ocean pollution? The tip of the iceberg is plastic waste shown up there. Then the invisible components are oil spills. Oil spills are very dangerous to the health of the ocean because they kill those microscopic organisms I mentioned that generate oxygen for the Earth's atmosphere. Are we in any danger today of ending oxygen production? No, there's plenty of oxygen to go around. But it's an early warning sign. And if oil spills into the ocean continue unabated in the years ahead, uh, there will be consequences and they won't be good for us. Mercury is another threat to human health. I'll talk more about its sources and its impacts in a moment. Manufactured chemicals, all the tens of thousands of chemicals that have been produced by the chemical industry since basically since the end of World War II, uh, many of which end up in the oceans, which is the ultimate sink for chemical pollution. Now we have pesticides, which in a sense are a subset of the manufactured chemicals, but important in their own right applied in vast quantities to farmers' fields, lawns and gardens. An awful lot of those pesticides wash off, get into rivers and end up in the oceans. And then finally, we along the coast, along the world's coastlines, we have all the nutrients that pour into the oceans, all the carbon, the phosphorus, the nitrogen that comes out of agricultural runoff, runoff from animal feeding operations, uh, sewage, untreated sewage. And all of that uh, causes eutrophication of the oceans. So let's let's dig into some of these different types of pollution and their health effects in more detail. We'll start with the major drivers. So the major two major drivers are of mercury pollution are coal combustion and artisanal gold mining. I'll say more about that in a second. We have huge production, uh, huge increases in the production of plastics and the next somewhere between 10 and 12 million tons of plastic waste gets into the ocean each year. We have huge increases in the production of manufactured chemicals. We have ocean dumping, munitions, nuclear waste, chemical waste. Just a couple of years ago, uh, a major uh, collection of 55 gallon drums full of DDT was found off the coast of um, Southern California. And then we have the whole issue of uncontrolled development along the world's coast. We, we see it here in the States as more and more people want to live along the coastlines, but it's a, it's a global phenomenon. And close to 40% of the world's population now lives within 10 kilometers of our coast. So let, let me tell you more about these. Um, the two main sources of mercury pollution in the ocean are coal combustion and, and gold mining. So how does that work? It does not seem obvious at first blush. Well, the way the burning of coal leads to mercury pollution has to do with the fact that all coal or almost all coal contains mercury in small amounts. But when you burn hundreds of thousands of tons of coal, those small amounts add up and become a lot of mercury. When the coal is burned in a power plant or a steel mill or another facility, the mercury in the coal vaporizes, goes up the stack, goes into the atmosphere, tiny droplets. It can travel long distances and eventually washes down into the rivers and into the ocean. And when mercury, when silvery metallic mercury, the stuff that we all know from thermometers, gets into the ocean, it undergoes a chemical change. It becomes a very toxic form of mercury known as methylmercury. And methylmercury has two bad properties. Number one, it's toxic to the brain and nervous system, especially of babies whose brains are still developing. And it has the unfortunate property that it concentrates as it moves up the food chain. So the concentration of mercury in seawater is almost negligible. And then there's a little bit in plankton a little bit more in the small fish that eat the plankton, more again in the middle-sized fish that eat the little fish. And finally, when you get to the predatory fish like tuna, like swordfish, like striped bass, like bluefish, who are at the top of the marine food chain, they can build up mercury to some pretty astounding levels because they 
they take into their bodies all the mercury that was eaten by the little guys on the food chain below them. And then if an expectant mom or a child eats tuna fish or swordfish that's loaded with mercury, that mercury gets into the mother's body, goes right through into her baby. And we know from good studies that our group has done and others have done that prenatal exposure, early life exposure of an infant to methylmercury causes loss of IQ, behavioral problems, shortening of attention span, a whole suite of negative impacts that are not consistent with that child's getting into Boston Latin School. That's why it is so important to protect infant brains against mercury and not to speak of other toxic chemicals like lead. The second source of mercury is something that we don't see in the United States, except maybe very sporadically, but it's a big deal in the world's poorest countries. And this is artisanal gold mining. Basically, local people in the world's poorest countries panning for gold in rivers uh, to supplement their meager income. And what they do, what, what would happen here is that these, uh, this woman and the, uh, and the kids in the river will collect gravel in their pan. They'll see little flecks of gold shining in the gravel. And what they will then do is they will take the pan inside. They will add a little liquid mercury to the gravel. They buy the mercury from a vendor and they pour the liquid mercury into the pan and the mercury forms an amalgam, it, which is to say it dissolves the mercury. Uh, and you have this mixture of gold and mercury, which can be separated from the rock. They can throw the rock away. And then what they do is they take that pan containing the amalgam, they heat it over a stove, often right in the kitchen, right where the kids are, and they boil off the mercury and then they're left with the gold, which they can sell on the market. And it sounds small, it sounds stupid, but it's millions of people around the world doing this in the world's poorest countries. And collectively, it adds up to a lot of mercury poisoning in the people who are exposed and a lot of mercury pollution of, of the world's oceans. There's a kind of a cool graph that looks at the history of mercury emissions going back to the 1500s. There was always a little bit of mercury in the world for the last many thousands of years. The, the Romans had it. They mined it in Spain at Almaden in Spain, where there's still a mercury mine. But mercury emissions really took off with the opening of Spanish America, the huge mercury deposits that were found in uh, mostly in Peru. And then uh, with the coming of the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s, 1800s, the burning of lots of coal, mercury emissions went up and then have continued to rise into the last 100 years. Only in the last 40 or 50 years since we started uh, controls in this country and other countries under legislation like the Clean Air Act have mercury emissions began to go down, but they're still, as you can see, much, much higher than they were in pre-industrial times. And the green at the bottom shows the contribution of North American sources. Here is the, here's a graph showing the global trend in the production of new chemicals. There's something like 120,000 synthetic manufactured man-made chemicals on the market today. Production is going up very steadily, three, three and a half percent per year, which means a doubling time in global chemical production about every 25 or 30 years. One of the real problems with this whole situation is that most of these chemicals are never tested for safety or toxicity before they enter the market. Chemists invent the chemical, chemical engineers find products to put it into, useful, beneficial products, and the stuff goes on the marketplace untested. And unfortunately, a lot of those chemicals then get loose from the products in which they're placed, get into the environment, and they get into people. The CDC does rolling surveys of the American population, and they now typically find anywhere from two to 300 manufactured chemicals in all of our bodies. Low levels to be sure, otherwise we wouldn't be walking around, but we're all exposed every day 
to a whole suite of untested chemicals. And I worry most about the little guys, the infants in the womb, the young children whose brains and other organ systems are still, still developing. For us. So we know from multiple, multiple studies are so intensely vulnerable to these chemicals. We are really fouling our own nest in a very serious way, which is simply not sustainable. Here's a parallel graph showing the world production of plastic, which if anything is going up even faster than chemical production. By the way, a, a, a fun fact here, I guess it's fun, is that the main feedstock, both for the chemicals and for the plastics is fossil fuels. It was oil, more recently it's natural gas, it's taking over and basically the carbon in the oil, the gas becomes the building block for all of these all of this chemical production. So chemical and plastic production is intimately linked to the extraction of uh, coal, oil, and most especially gas. 80% of ocean pollution arises on the land, 20% from ships at sea but, and oil spills at sea and so on. But 80% from the land, uh, stuff that we throw into waste dumps, stuff that runs off into rivers and so on. And that means that a powerful strategy for controlling ocean pollution is to control the sources on land that are responsible for the pollution. Take a look, if you will, at this panel here. You know, what you're looking at, you're looking at a coastline. This is a beach running from top to bottom. This is the land here, you can see some buildings. And here you have a river pouring out between the sandbars. And Upstream on this river is one of these massive, what's called a CAFO, a confined animal feeding operation where thousands of pigs or chicken or cattle are squeezed together in a small piece of real estate, kept penned up in cages and are fed and fattened for market, given nutrients, antibiotics, whatever else they're given. Well, all the waste from those facilities runs out through this thing into the ocean. This is the ocean out here. And for example, if you fly at low altitude along the coast of North Carolina, where a lot of these facilities are concentrated, you can see this miserable black brown sludge extending out in some cases a couple of miles into the, into the Atlantic off these things. They're really, truly dreadful. So what were, the, what were some of the key findings of our Monaco Commission on Human Health and Ocean Pollution? Well, the first one was that pollution has many harmful effects on marine ecosystems. It contributes to the destruction of coral reefs. It contributes to the, to the decline in fish stocks in countries around the world. It's not the whole story in either situation, but it's an important player. It has lots of effects on, on human health. I've mentioned the mercury that gets into tuna and swordfish. Other toxic chemicals also get into fish and the main way in which chemical and uh, the main way in which pollution in the ocean comes back to us is by the consumption of seafood, oysters, mussels, clams, fin fish, all of them pick up mercury, uh, microplastic particles, toxic chemicals that are dumped into the ocean. And as the dumping continues, as it increases and accumulates from year to year, to year the totality of ocean pollution is getting worse. Ocean pollution is not evenly spread. We certainly have it here in the USA, but on a global scale, something like 90% of pollution related disease takes place in low income and middle income countries. And when you look at the globe from space, the worst coastal pollution is along the coastlines of developing countries. A group who are at particular risk are indigenous people like the Eskimos in the far north, the Inuit, who, uh, whose traditional diet depends upon fish and marine mammals. And when the oceans get polluted, the chemical pollutants, the mercury in the ocean concentrate to high levels in the very same species that those people eat. And the consequence is that they have to choose between eating foods that are going to poison them or switching to uh, usually the worst, lowest end 
of the modern diet like Kentucky Fried Chicken and its competitors with the consequence that a lot of those indigenous communities have abandoned their traditional diets and gotten into serious problems of obesity and diabetes. There's always these unforeseen follow-on effects from ecological destruction. Ocean pollution is surprisingly poorly mapped. We, we have reasonable maps of ocean pollution around the United States, so do the Europeans and a couple of other industrially developed countries, but worldwide, we know very little about ocean pollution and we know least of all about pollution in the deep ocean out beyond the 12 mile or the 200 mile limit. But here's the kicker, here's, this is the good news after all the gloom and doom I've been putting out for the last 20 minutes. And the good news is that ocean pollution can be prevented. Just as we've made enormous progress in this country and in other developed countries in the past half century in preventing air pollution and water pollution, we know how to prevent ocean pollution. In fact, we've done it. And in our report, we presented a number of case studies. One of the poster children is the cleanup of Boston Harbor, which is uh, from what it was when I was a student at BLS to what it is today is just mind boggling. It's, it's, it's gone from being a, a sewer to a gem. It's, it's achievable. And it, people who have done uh, cost effectiveness studies on the cleanup of Boston Harbor report that the return on investment is around five or six to one, five or six dollars return for every dollar invested in the form of improved fishery, improved tourism, uh, other collateral benefits. This is an interesting graph. It does not pertain to ocean pollution, but it speaks to the feasibility of preventing pollution. It focuses on air pollution. It's looking at the United States. And if you look at the horizontal axis, it's looking at the time span from 1970 to the near present. And what this shows, this line here trending downward from left to right, it, that line represents air pollution levels, average air pollution levels across the USA in the last 50 years. And air pollution has come down 70%. Uh, 1968 is right about here. That's when that picture was that I showed you at the beginning. 1970 is right here. That's when President Nixon signed the Clean Air Act. And this has been the consequence. It's been a, it's been a combination of law, policy, enforcement, incentives, all the tools that government can use to, to clean the air have been applied and they've been very successful. Now we've all heard the trope that controlling pollution kills the economy. We've heard it a million ways, that it costs jobs, that it sends jobs overseas, that it makes uh, business uneconomical. Well, the data don't support that claim at all. The, the data show that in the same 50 year span that we succeeded in reducing pollution in the USA by 70%, the GDP grew by 250%. Not saying that one caused the other, of course, but the point here is that Preventing pollution has several effects that are actually compatible with economic growth. What are they? First of all, we have lots of disease is, present, is prevented. Lots of premature death is prevented. That means that healthcare costs are reduced. And because people are healthier and live longer, they contribute, they have more years to contribute to the economy. Also, they're smarter. You have to remember that one of the, that, that hidden within this line here, showing the 70% decline in pollution, is the fact that we have reduced lead pollution in this country, airborne lead pollution, by 90%, by more than 90%, mainly by getting lead out of gasoline. And that means that the average intelligence of every child born in America since about 1980 is five points higher than the average intelligence of old people like myself who were born before that time. And these kids are brighter, they're more creative, they can do stuff that a lot of us cannot dream of doing, and that all contributes to the economic gains that result from the control of pollution. So just don't let anybody tell you that pollution control is bad for the economy. It simply is not quite the contrary. Here are some successes in, ocean, in the control of ocean pollution. I mentioned the Boston Harbor cleanup, similar cleanup in Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong, 
great progress in restoring Chesapeake Bay, uh, control of POPs, that's persistent organic pollutants in Europe, and, and so on, restoration of some coral reefs in Samoa. And every one of these actions is basically a one-time action to, to control sources pollution, and then they produce lasting benefits. So it's a one-time cost and a lasting benefit, which is uh, great economics. I mentioned at the beginning that our work was supported by the Scientific Center of Monaco, which is a, a government agency in Monaco. And that's that picture there, that's Prince Albert of Monaco, whom uh, Peter Kelly uh, reminded me that he's probably a, dis a distant cousin of Prince Albert because his mother was Grace Kelly, the actress. And Prince Albert is deeply committed to improvement of the Earth's environment. And under his sponsorship, we, we did this work and then we presented it in Monaco in December of 2020. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there. We had to do it virtually because of COVID. But we had this Monaco International Symposium where we released our report. And he, um, he issued something called the Declaration of Monaco, which called upon leaders in all countries and all citizens of the earth to safeguard human health and preserve the earth, our common home, by ending pollution of the oceans. And these were the specific, these were the specific calls in that Declaration of Monaco. Firstly, and most fundamentally, that countries around the world have to get off fossil fuels. We have to wean ourselves of the addiction to fossil fuels and move rapidly to renewable energy, wind and solar tidal. And there's several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, if we stop the burning of fossil fuels, and that includes natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, we will reduce atmospheric emissions of carbon dioxide. That will prevent acidification of the oceans. It'll clear up air pollution, of course, and it will control the emission of the mercury that gets into the oceans. Next, we have to end plastic pollution. And I'm not saying that we can completely get off plastic. We shouldn't. I know as a pediatrician that some of the products that we use in the newborn nursery to save babies' lives could only be done with plastic. We could never do it with plastic or metal. We need certain plastics, but we don't need triple wrapped disposable plastic on every CD we buy or uh, every bag of screws you buy at, the, at Home Depot. That's, that's ridiculous. And part of the explosion of single use plastic that we've seen in the past decade has been a deliberate effort by the fossil fuel industry to channel their oil and their gas into plastic production to boost the world production of plastic um, uh, without concern for the consequences. And this, this is something that uh, is the consequence of deliberate action and deliberate action can control it. You're seeing some modest steps already. I mean, baby steps like stopping the use of plastic straws and certain cities and towns banning plastic bags. That's, that's all good. Those are, those are beginning steps, but we need to do more. Waste management and recycling are amazingly effective in places that really separate waste, greatly reduce their ocean pollution. The agricultural releases need to be controlled, and that's probably going to require a fairly fundamental revamping of the world's food system, which is needed for all kinds of reasons. Monitoring is important. I mentioned that ocean pollution is not very well mapped, and the only way to overcome that is by better monitoring. And then finally, we have, uh, we have marine protected areas. Uh, around the world. I think of these as the national parks of the of the sea. You remember that in 2016, President Obama created a huge marine protected area northwest of Hawaii. And there are other marine protected areas around the world where dredging, oil exploration, uh, other forms of exploitation of the ocean is, is prohibited and very important to, to expand these. So let me conclude with a couple of three slides on what we're doing in our program at Boston College, how our work on ocean pollution relates to the broader scope of work we're doing here. We, in the last three years, we built a program in global public health and the common good at BC. We now have an undergraduate minor. We're taking about 50 uh, students per year into the minor. It's being well received. 
And then we also have a research program called the Global Observatory on Pollution and Health, whose job is to do studies like the study of ocean pollution to look at pollution, climate change, energy trends, and their effects on health. We push these findings out. We work with partners around the world to translate our science to reality. So for example, we have uh, the partnership I've already mentioned with the Scientific Center of Monaco. We work with the World Health Organization. We work with the UN Environment Program. Um, we published several major reports in addition to the ocean pollution report. We published a report on health and economic impacts of air pollution in India, which came out just before Christmas. Um, that should say 20, there's a typo there. It was December 22, 2020. And we found that air pollution was responsible for 1.6 million deaths in India in, in a single year, 2019, the most recent data year for which data were available, 1.67 million deaths in a single year, unbelievable. Uh, in most of India, air pollution was well above the World Health Organization guideline of 10 micrograms. It was heaviest in the northern states where industry is most intense. And it had substantial economic losses equivalent to 1.36% uh, of India's GDP. Uh, we've been doing studies of pollution in children's health. And we find that pollution is responsible for more than 1 million deaths in kids around the world every year, mostly the little guys, most in the small countries. And in addition to causing uh, uh, deaths, pollution causes loss of IQ and other chronic diseases in children. We just uh, have been working on, we've, we've launched a big initiative to study the health impacts of natural gas in January of 2020, a year ago, that's another typo, apologies. We published a big report in the New England Journal of Medicine called The False Promise of Natural Gas, which examined natural gas across its entire lifespan. You've, you've all heard the, the saying that natural gas is a bridge fuel or a transition fuel, a clean alternative to coal and oil that's going to get us to a rosy future. That's a, that's a faulty narrative. It ignores the fact that the extraction of gas from places like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, by fracking is associated with major pollution, disease, and death in the communities where the fracking takes place. It ignores the fact that the, that the pipelines and the compressor stations that transport the gas are sources of significant hazard. They leak methane, which contributes to global warming, and they explode. We had a big gas line explosion up in the North Shore a couple of years ago, Andover, Merrimack Valley, which destroyed 110 homes, sent about 20 people, including two firefighters to the hospital, and killed one young boy. Uh, right now, there's uh, th this picture I show here, this thing that looks a bit like a red barn is not a red barn at all. That's a natural gas compressor station that uh, is uh, about to open up in North Weymouth, Massachusetts, 10 miles from Boston on the coast in a densely populated environmental justice community uh, with multiple associated hazards. And so we've been involved in a struggle to, uh, to try to stop the construction of this ill-conceived uh, enterprise. So with that, I'll close it up. Some time for questions. Uh, remind all of us that we are the stewards of this earth and we hold it in trust for our children. And at that point, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to the organizers. All right, Dr. Landrigan, thank you very much. Um, this presentation continues to inform, um, just really informative information, eye-opening. Um, and I might be dating myself here, but as a young girl who grew up watching Jacques Cousteau on television and was really enamored by all the beauty that Ocean Life offered to see where we are now and the things that we need to do to preserve that thing that brings us tranquility is uh, is critical. So thank you very much for sharing that. No, that's, um, and you'll know that it was the Principality of Monaco that supported Jacques Cousteau. So there's an organic link between his work and ours. About that. What, what a small and connected world in which we, we live, for sure. For sure. 
So um, thank you again. We are going to pivot to our question and answer session. Um, I'd like to thank those who submitted questions beforehand and we have some live questions in the queue as well. So um, I'd like to start actually with our first live question if we may. And the question is this, Dr. Landrigan, how do we get rid of the floating island of waste in the Pacific? I believe I've heard it called the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch um, recently. So what do we do? Do we dredge it? How, how do we get rid of that? Yeah, you know, the, the garbage patch, it's also known as the Great Ocean Gyre. And the, the one in the Pacific is the biggest, but it's one of five uh, in the world's oceans. Um, and it's formed by the, the, the currents that circulate in the sea. And this is sort of the, in the center of the currents. So that you've all seen, I'm sure on TV, the various proposals that have been put forward for cleaning these things up. There's a, there's a guy from, I think he's from Holland, who set out in the Pacific a couple of years ago with something that looked like a giant vacuum cleaner attached to a tugboat. Um, I mean, those, those proposals are, are well-intentioned. They'll do some good. There are some people on the West Coast now who are engaged in uh, going through the oceans, trying to pick up what they call ghost nets. These are abandoned fishing nets that float through the sea, some of them a couple of miles long, and they trap whales and fish and so on. It's, it's, it's fine. I mean, how can one criticize such well-intentioned work? But truth be told, I don't think it's very effective. Um, it's sort of like cleaning up the mess after it's already been spilled. And moreover, it ignores the fact that the plastic waste that you see floating on the surface of the ocean, the, the, the blue jugs, the yellow duckies, the rubber tires, all the rest of it, all of that stuff breaks down over time. The ocean is an unforgiving environment and that plastic degrades, it breaks down into what are called microplastic particles, microscopic particles, which sink to the bottom of the sea eventually and then get absorbed into the marine food chain. The only, the only lasting way to, to deal with this is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And that, and that means by and large, controlling land-based releases of plastic. Uh, most, of, most of the plastic that enters the oceans is washes into the sea from rivers and governments in countries around the world need to identify those sources. They're actually pretty well known and do something about them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, let me pivot to uh, one of our pre-submitted questions, um, which is, in addition to changing personal habits, like reducing, reducing fish consumption, avoiding single-use plastics, where would you prior prioritize action on the part of the public in a collective effort? Um, are we writing letters to elected officials? Are we boycotting companies and manufacturers, industries? What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, when I answer this kind of question, I, I always try to remind people that that they can act on three levels. You've, you've already mentioned the first of those levels, which is in their own home. Uh, the, the products that you buy, the, the stuff you bring into the house, the decision whether to do a new gas hookup or to put a solar panel on your roof if you have a, a situation that permits that. Um, multiple things you can do in your own home environment. You can act in your local community, in the, in the city of Boston, in the city or the town or the state where you live, and encourage elected officials to, uh, to reduce uh, use of fossil fuels, reduce air pollution, reduce careless spraying of pesticides on parks and playgrounds and golf courses. And then finally, we can all act in the broader society, vote, elect people that are concerned about the environment, support uh, politicians who take steps to protect the environment and punish those who don't. That's ultimately, that's where the control lies. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Let me pivot because uh, we have a live question. And it's a little bit of a takeoff. So let me, let me take it down another level. Um, a student asks, what can high schoolers do? So there are many things that we can do as adults, as um, you know, the population that can vote and are of a certain age, but is there anything specific that you think our high schoolers can do to help the well, cause? Well, I, I think high schoolers are already doing a lot. I mean, think of Greta Thunberg. And all of us, I think, are depending on the generations that come after us to clean up the mess that we've made. Um, so what can, what can high schoolers do now and in the future? Because today's high schoolers are obviously tomorrow's adults. Uh, the first is to educate yourselves about these issues. Uh, educate yourself about global warming, 
about climate change, about pollution, about ocean pollution, its causes, its consequences. There's a body of knowledge out there. And uh, something I forgot to mention is I can certainly, Nicole, I can make available the full report on which my presentation is based. I can send you the, uh, the PDF and then uh, feel free to distribute it wherever you wish. Okay. Um, we'll do that. And, and, and then um, uh, today's students need to also educate themselves to the political process because it's not so very many years when they will be able to vote. And, and they need, uh, if you're gonna be participants in society, uh, you need to be knowledgeable participants. If there's one thing we've learned in the United States over the last five years is, is that democracy is not a spectator sport, that, be, that being engaged in the governance of the country matters, uh, that facts matter, that truths matter, and only it's only through an educated populace that uh, that democracy can be preserved and that the planet can be protected. I think that's what the founders of Boston Latin School were thinking about back in 1635. They obviously didn't, they couldn't have predicted a lot of the details of the present world, but they did understand at core that educated men and women were the salvation of society. Indeed, no truer words are said. Um, thank you. Um, our next question uh, comes from someone who is participating from Cleveland and who asks, can you comment on the effect of cleaning up internal rivers on the oceans, such as the Cuyah uh, Cuyahoga, excuse me, uh, which eventually flow into the Atlantic via the Great Lakes? And do you have an opinion on nuclear power generation? Yeah, so let me take the one at a time. So rivers, so I mentioned to you that I spent one year of my life, 67, 68, in Cleveland as an intern at Cleveland Metropolitan General Hospital. Uh, that picture of air pollution that I showed you at the beginning was from that year. Uh, the Cuyahoga River didn't catch fire during the year I was in Cleveland, but it was a year or two later that the Cuyahoga River, which runs through Cleveland, caught fire uh, because of all the petroleum waste that were in the river. And it was that event actually that led to the passage of the Safe Drinking Water Act a couple of years ago. So Cleveland play, has played an important role in the environmental history of this country. Um, cleaning up rivers is, is critical because as the questioner points out, uh, waste that gets dumped into rivers goes into lakes and eventually ends up in the, in, in the oceans of the world. So you, the most effective way to control pollution is to, is to prevent it from ever getting loose in the first place. The okay. question about nuclear power. So I know some proponents argue that nuclear power is uh, a major solution to, to global climate change. And they, they point to the fact that nuclear power generates no carbon dioxide. It does not contribute to global warming, all of which is, all of which is true. But just as I pointed out a few minutes ago that when you look at natural gas, you don't, you can't, it's, it's not sufficient just to look at the end stage of natural gas. We all acknowledge that natural gas burns cleaner than coal or oil, but that's only a, a bit of the story. You have to look at the whole life cycle of natural gas to realize it's associated with hazard at every stage from extraction to combustion. Well, a similar logic applies in the case of nuclear fuel. So first of all, where does, where does nuclear, nuclear, nuclear fuel come from? It comes from uranium mines. Uranium mining is a terribly dangerous occupation. Uranium miners die in excessive numbers compared to the US population from lung cancer. And that's because they inhale a combination of silica and radon, which is abundant in the mines. Radon and uranium go together and levels of radon in the mines are high. And in the United States, a lot of that mining has been done historically in the Navajo reservation and the Navajo miners have a shockingly high rate of lung cancer, which cannot simply be explained away by cigarette smoking. Then whenever you burn nuclear fuel in a reactor, you, you end up with waste, nuclear waste. It's inevitable, you can't avoid it. And we have not yet after 75 years of atomic energy in this country, figured out what in the hell to do with our nuclear waste. It's, it is the inevitable consequence of burning nuclear fuel. You cannot burn nuclear fuel and not end up with nuclear waste. And nobody wants nuclear waste in their backyard. We can't dump it into the deep oceans. What are we gonna do with it? I see it as an intractable problem. And even though there may be some short-term benefits to, nuclear, to the nuclear option, I think there are some huge 
uh, long-term downside. And then finally, of course, people say, well, the engineers are getting better and better every year. They build these newer, smaller reactors at a Six Sigma standard that are almost impossible to blow up. Well, you know, almost impossible isn't good enough when you're dealing with nuclear. Think of Chernobyl, think of Three Mile Island, think of Fukushima. Things happen. Not Life is not entirely predictable. There's a volcano erupting in the Caribbean this morning. Things happen that people don't anticipate. And it's impossible to protect nuclear reactors against every possible uh, uh, contingency. So I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a willfully blind option and it's one that we really should not pursue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, speaking of location, let me ask, um, does the rights of nature movement as is happening in New Zealand have promise for cleaning the oceans? Maybe. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I haven't studied it deeply enough to be to be certain. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, are either of these um, are projects like Cape Winds harmful to the oceans and marine ecosystems? Not if, not if they're well done. Uh, um, there is the issue that they uh, of, of killing some birds, so they have the the the, the, uh, the wind turbines have to be carefully placed, but in the aggregate, those facilities benefit the oceans because they reduce the need for burning fossil fuels, which means less CO2, less airborne particulates, less mercury, less mm -hmm. climate change. Okay, great. We have um, two more questions and then, um, and then we will wrap, but could you talk a little bit about recyclability and biodegradable possibilities and the limits of plastic? Yeah, there's been a lot of talk in the chemistry community in recent years about biodegradable plastic. And I think the concept is good. I think the, the execution remains to be proven. Um, uh, some of the plastics that have been claimed as biodegradable turn out to be less than fully biodegradable. And, uh, but nonetheless, that said, we're, we're not gonna get away from plastics. We're not gonna get away from chemical uh, from chemicals, um, I, I strongly support the green chemistry movement as, as a way forward, but it has to be done right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's funny, uh, a fact I just learned yesterday, um, in as far away as I've thrown my plastic straws, that less than 1% of ocean pollutants are plastic straws. There are just so many other pollutants that are out there. Um, so certainly more to be done there. Um, last question for you, Dr. Landrigan, thank you. And it is, is pollution of the oceans believed to be exacerbating La Nina or El Nino weather pattern systems? Uh, I don't think that the pollution of the oceans is exacerbating weather systems. But when you look a little deeper, you realize that most pollution the, the, the root cause of most pollution is the burning of fossil fuels. And the burning of fossil fuels that emit not only pollution, but also carbon dioxide and contribute to global climate change are certainly driving um, El Nino and La Nina. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's see if we could sneak this in. One last question um, before we wrap. So what is the right answer for power generation? Um, wind turbines kill birds, dams mess with fish, what is the right answer for power? In well, your I, I think we have no choice but to go to safe, clean, uh, non-nuclear renewable power. And I think it's feasible. I don't think it's pie in the sky anymore. And the reason I say that is the global investment in wind and solar has increased from 4% to about 20, uh, sorry, global production of electricity from wind and solar has increased from 4% of the world's electricity in the year 2010 to almost 20% of the world's electricity today. We've had a 500% increase in electricity production from wind and solar in just one decade. That's extraordinary. And in the same time period, the cost of producing electricity from solar has fallen by about 90%, nine zero. The cost of producing electricity from wind has fallen by about 50%, economies of scale. So, so I think that we're very close to a tipping point in which renewables are going to uh, outpace fossil fuels. And there's the real likelihood that uh, investment in fossil fuels in gas and oil and coal could become stranded assets. Investors need to think about that. Uh, institute, people who are managing institutional uh, portfolios need to think about that. 
uh, it becomes one more reason for institutions to divest from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, again, Dr. Landrigan, um, so full of facts, um, and it certainly has me and I'm sure all of us uh, participating today thinking differently about what we can do um, now that we are armed with this knowledge. So again, much, much appreciated. Um, so a couple of things. Um, Everyone who's participated today um, will receive a replay link, as well as the graphic of the infoberg, uh, I'm sorry, the pollution berg that was shared uh, during Dr. Landrigan's presentation, which is full of information. So it is an infoberg for sure. Um, so you'll receive that. And uh, I'd also like to take a moment to invite you to the third in our inquiry and insight series. On Wednesday, May 26th, we'll have a conversation with Dr. Bari Andamarian, class of 1992, um, who will share with us how gene therapy is used to fight against sickle cell disease, a disease that we know has many faces and impacts millions of people year over year. So we invite you to join us for that. More information to come. And um, again, Dr. Landry, we cannot thank you enough for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us. Thank you for being the friend to Boston Latin as you and your brothers are uh, for sure. And to everyone out there, thank you for taking time with us this afternoon. On behalf of the Boston Latin School and the association, we wish you and your families continued health, wellness, and safety. Have a terrific weekend and take good care. Thank you. Okay.